Welcome back. After having gone through the basics of climate change, we are now turning finally to disease and health. To look at the pathways that link the various facets of climate change to various diseases. So how does this work? Before we do that, let's just rehearse some of the definitions from climate. First of all, climate, as you have learned now, is both gradual change of meteorological variables and extreme changes, which we call extreme weather events. It affects temperature, rainfall, sea level rise, the ocean gets warmer and sourer. These are the facets that we are dealing with in this uh, lecture. Then there are greenhouse gases. They are long-lived, most of them, like carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide. And there are short-lived ones, like black carbon, methane, and particles. The health impact is uh, after deducing, and we will see this uh, in this lecture, is what remains in terms of ill health after deducing the efforts of adaptation and mitigation. So let's rehearse what mitigation was. Mitigation is preventing future climate change from happening. So we do this either by reducing emissions or by increasing sinks where the um, where the CO2 is absorbed, like in forests. Adaptation, again, is dealing with already committed climate change, while um, health co-benefits arise from good mitigation policies, which were originally directed to climate, but which also reap benefits for health. Think of going by bike. It's good for both the climate and for your cardiovascular fitness. OK, that's the last of climate. Um, science, now we get into health. It doesn't get any uh, wheel, more wieldy, um, so I simplified things uh, with this cartoon. The directions of the lines are just illustrative, so you see on the, on the horizontal axis the time line between now and the end of the century, and on the vertical axis you see the disease burden in units, uh, mortality, whatever you like. So you see a baseline, and we assume that without climate change, the baseline would be the same until the end of the century. And then there is a rising line. That's now the potential health impact that's added on to the baseline disease burden. And then at some stage, hopefully in December this year, at the COP21 in Paris, mitigation policy begins. So now we are reaping the health co-benefits of mitigation. And that, the green, is always the health bit, uh, the positive bit. So we are getting cardiovascularly more fit. We are uh, having less pollution and so forth. So that nibbles into diseases that otherwise are not linked to climate change primarily. Then there will be less climate change, so there will also be less negative uh, health impact. This is the health impact avoided by mitigation. It will be less hot, so all the other effects will also be less, the health effects. We are, will not be sitting on our hands if we do good climate policy. We will adapt. We will build dams. We will buy mosquito nets and so forth, develop vaccines. So there's another reduction in the possible um, disease impact or health impact. And now if you count all this together, you have to account for the health co-benefits on the bottom. So I've shifted this, this part up, and the red is now the net health impact. It could even be positive. So uh, this is not about doom and gloom. This is about how can you make sure that good climate policy and good health policy work together to reduce the bad health, health impact and to increase the good health impact, the health co-benefits. So this is the conceptual uh, beginning of this talk. And of course, we are talking about generations in front of us because climate change won't go away and health impacts only if we uh, do something about it. This is a graph which I will guide you through in steps, because it's very complicated. I took it from the Lancet Commission on Climate Change, uh, just appeared last month. And it is the latest and the most complete graph that I know between greenhouse gas emissions, 
the various dimensions of climate change and diseases. Let me take you through this. So we all know that climate change has some facets, which I just mentioned before, higher temperatures, rainfall, sea level rise, extreme weather, ocean get warmer and sourer, and uh, air pollutants uh, are emitted. So these are the major facets of climate change. And then at the bottom, you have the main disease groups. There are about 81 climate-sensitive diseases, and it would be absolutely boring to go all through all of these at this stage. Um, so I will group them. Undernutrition, one of the key uh, components, diarrhea, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, harmful algal blooms that may sound a little bit off uh, order but for some of you. These are linked to cholera, in fact, and so linked to diarrhea and uh, occur when oceans warm. Vector-borne diseases and finally mental disorders. So there's quite a range of infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, malnutrition, Injuries should have been included in this graph uh, to my taste, but I just give you the graph as is. And the question now is, what is the process? Which element does what to which disease? And now comes the full graph, and please uh, remain seated. This is quite complicated, and it looks like, um, you know, like a railway system or the subway map of London. And let's just look at some of these, and I invite you to look at this in peace and quiet at home. Uh, go from ocean acidification in the left um, corner, left upper corner. Ocean acidification leads to reduced fishery yields. And that uh, leads to undernutrition in coastal population uh, who eat a lot of fish. But uh, reduced fisheries also, if you go this other blue arrow up, uh, also is a consequence of warmer oceans, where warmer oceans have less oxygen. So you see two facets of climate change conjure to have just the reduced fishery, and that, of course, is influencing undernutrition. But there are other arrows from climate change to undernutrition. Go up the purple one, and you see reduced agricultural productivity due to heat, floods, drought, you name it, fires. So you see that one disease can be impacted by several um, facets of climate change, and then they interact among each other because undernutrition is very, in children particularly, is very heavily influenced by diarrhea. You see this little uh, arc between the adjacent boxes to the left uh, bottom. So it would be um, too lengthy to go through the entire thing. Do it at home, and uh, you will see how complicated this picture is if you only look at climate and health. But uh, the Lancet Commission, of course, has added another, uh, another dimension, which is the social dimension. We only, not only have health impacts, but we also have impacts on the social determinants of health. Because health is not only <laughs> affected by climate change, as you all know, but also by uh, poverty, it leads to loss of habitation, mass migration, violent conflict, and other social determinants of health. And they have put arrows here as well from the bright red and also from the purple red. So we have a very complicated web, web of um, influences, and you can um, realize and you can understand that to study this, it's very complicated and not for the faint-hearted. I still invite you to join us and others to study this, and of course you have to segment this web in order to be able to study uh, some aspects of it.